evening, everyone. And uh, I'd like to welcome you to, if I get back to the right page here, to Grace Life Unleashed podcast with Pastor Dave and friends playing chess in a checkers world. Anyways, we are a ministry of uh, Marine Bible Church, uh, Grace Life Church, and we're located in Evansville, Indiana. And if you're interested in helping us out, because, you know, the needs keep going on, I hate to say that, um, our address is P.O. Box 6033, Evansville, Indiana, 47719. We're meeting at the downtown YMCA. We are, in, in theory, and we're still working on a couple things, the Church of the Y, um, and uh, things are moving forward there. It's a good location, a lot of people going in and out of there, uh, meet on Sunday mornings. And the bottom here is my phone number, and if you have any questions... Any comments? Uh, I'm getting a lot of texts and stuff. Very encouraging, and I appreciate that um, in regards to what's going on. Uh, if you want to know more about our church, um, website is gracelifeunleashed.com. Our YouTube is Grace Life Unleashed by Dave Sigmund. And uh, Facebook is Grace Life Church and or Brian Bible Church. And our Rumble account is Grace Life Unleashed. Um, our purpose of our, our midweek study is to help us get through economic hardships that I truly believe we're going to be going through. Um, I've been covering some of this stuff now for about the last two months, and we're we're kind of at a, a pinnacle right now in regards to the stock market. And I want to assure you that the stock market has nothing to do with the economy, although it has everything to do with the economy. And, and the more you understand the stock market, the more you'll realize that um, the stock market is designed to do one thing, and that's to take all your money. And we're at the point now where, where the guys that I follow and, and some of the stuff that I've learned, um, we're, we're headed towards a major shift as far as uh, correction coming up, starting very soon and continuing on for I don't know how long. Um, but the, the guys I'm following um, aren't painting a real rosy picture short term. Our life rule number one is don't get dead. And, and someone asked me, he said, well, what do, you, what do you mean by that and why is that such a big deal? And, and the answer is, is pretty simple. Um, as a Christian, uh, Paul is very explicit in that he doesn't want us to be uh, overthrowing the government. Uh, Paul never got involved in protests. Uh, Paul never got involved in government. And uh, I even know some Christians that don't vote because they just don't get involved in government. Um, I, I vote. I, I think I, our vote counts towards something. But I'm not going to run for a political office. By, by definition, politics is compromise. And I'm not interested in compromising. But in First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, Paul says, I exhort, therefore, first of all, supplications, prayer, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Okay, And then he, he, he explains that better in verse 2. He says, for kings and for all that are in authority. Wow. That would pretty much be everyone, right? And this is why, and this is what we should be praying for, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. That's what we're after. And that does not say that we may overthrow the government and replace it with something better. Okay? Um, one of the things I even told Nick, you know, if, if you do what you want to do, <laughs> you will be dead. Um, the powers and be would make sure that you do not live. Uh, it's a, this is Satan's world, and you're not going to change the system. Um, granted, our, our economy is based on a Keynesian philosophy of debt. In other words, money is created by debt. And what's happening, if you understand the stock market, is um, this is not a stock market problem. This is a, a bond market problem. This is a, a money borrowing problem. Um, the bond market is so much bigger than the stock market. But most of us have never dealt with the bond market. I, I really haven't. Um, but that's, that's money that's borrowed to other countries and to huge millionaires and billionaires and the movement of money between countries and exchanges and paying for goods and not goods. And the U.S. dollar is, is the major um, pedestal in the world currency in a sense. Things are paid for with dollars. And so countries have to take their currency and convert it into dollars to pay for things like oil. And what's happening with all the money that's been being printed is um, they're trying to get some of that money back and they're raising interest rates. And right now the yield curve is upside down, which means it costs more to borrow money short term than long term. And, and I know some of you have lost already, but that's not how the system works. The system is designed 
for banks in particular to borrow money short term and lend it out long term and they keep the spread you know they borrow it at two percent and borrow it to you for four or five percent and there's a three percent difference they keep it and life goes on right now it costs more to borrow money short term than it does long term so banks have just quit borrowing money and they've raised their interest rates now to try to cover some of those and so they're destroying the housing market destroying the car market um, and, and what's going to happen is the bond market's going to come to a standstill and it's going to collapse on itself. Um, and that's when the problems are going to start. This will be a banking crisis probably more than anything else. Paul goes on in verse 3 and says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. So again, I, I love these verses because you know we're praying for a peaceable life. And Paul tells us right there what our job is. It's not to overthrow the government. It's not to cause anarchy. Our job is to see that all men be saved and come unto knowledge of the truth. We're into evangelism. And Paul says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. And what did Christ do? He gave himself as a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and in verity. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So again, I always say live under the radar. Uh, there was a time earlier on in my ministry when I was, you know, young and dumb, we'll call it. Um, I wanted to be like the Apostle Paul. I mean, when Paul was described, I believe it was in Acts, he was described as someone who turned the world upside down. And I'm like, I want to do that. You know, you want to just make a make an impact, make an effect, you know, make, just do something really, you know, just have an effect on people in the world. But then as you study, you know, the Apostle Paul, man, the guy was hunted down like a, a rabid dog that had to be put out of, you know, its misery. This guy couldn't go anywhere without being persecuted. He couldn't go anywhere without being, you know, pretty much hunted down and being killed. Uh, and I said, you know, I want to be like a Timothy or like a Titus. They kind of lived under the radar and they just did their thing and, and had a good impact too. So, yeah, you do you, whatever you want to do. So, again, when I, when I say, you know, don't get dead, um, we are trying to get through this current situation. I have no idea how long it's going to last. I don't know how bad it's going to be. But I do know it's not as going to be as good as most people are saying. Now, one of my life events, and, and again, I, I put this in here for a reason because it affected me when I went through it, is, is Lori at one time said, you know, stop throwing Bible verses at me because I tend to do that to people. I, I throw Bible verses at them. And um, there are times when people don't want a Bible study they want answers and what she said was just tell me what to do and she was at a place to where you know she needed answers and not you know someone hitting over the head with a Bible uh, she needed some help and you're like well, well what is your precedence on that well it comes from Galatians chapter 6 the first five verses Paul says brethren of a man be overtaken in a fault and that's somebody who's, who's faltering let's say okay struggling and whether it's his fault or her fault or not is not even the question they are struggling okay and Paul says ye which are spiritual and that should hopefully be all of us and, and we went through a definition of what it means to be spiritual in church over the last few weeks in 2nd Corinthians the easy definition of being spiritual is you care about others carnal is self-love and spiritual is others love you know I realize it's more than that but that's the easiest way to look at yourself in the mirror is do you care about others or do you only care about yourself and so Paul is saying, you need to care about others, and then you need to restore that person as one in the spirit of meekness, concerning thyself, lest thou also be tempted. But then Paul tells us how we're going to do that in verse 2. He says, bear ye one another's burdens. Sometimes you need to come alongside someone, you know, someone who's struggling, someone who's hurting, someone who needs to be restored, and you need to bear their burdens with them. In other words, you know, go alongside of them and, and help them. And go, I don't have time for that, Pastor. Okay, then you're selfish. Okay, I know you can't fix everyone, but there's probably someone in your life that needs help. Okay, and then Paul says, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So here we got a law. The law is bear ye one of those burdens. And there's a time when God is saying you need to help someone out. Okay, and then Paul says, for if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. And our goal is verse four, but let every man prove his own work, which almost seems to be a contradiction to verse two, because it is. 
There's a time when you need to go alongside someone and you need to help them out. And there's a time when you can now let them go again to, you know, fly out of the nest and, and be on their own again. Okay. So let your man prove, prove, show his own work. And then shall we have rejoicing in himself alone and not in others. So we want people to, you know, grow up, get back on their own two feet and get back to work. And then verse five says, for every man shall bear his own burdens. So even though verse two and verse five are opposite, verse five is the end results. But there's a time when we gotta walk alongside someone and hold their hand. So what we're gonna do here is, I hate to say this, but we're gonna hold your hand a little bit. Um, because what, what's surprising me, and it probably shouldn't surprise me, is the amount of people who are either in denial or in ignorance when it comes to what's going on with the economy. And someone posted something on YouTube. It was kind of a snarky little little uh, response saying, you know, why as a pastor am I not just teaching the Bible and forget about the economy? Well, th there's a reason for that, okay? Um, as a church and as your church, if you go to a church, hopefully you do, um, we need to be encouraging each other. But uh, churches do not exist on love, okay? Uh, families do not exist on love, although love is important. But you need money to function as a family. You need money to function as a church. If the economy goes bad, okay, if the economy f falters, okay, let, let's say that, you know, inflation continues at a high rate and you have less and less uh, extra money available. And I've talked to enough pastors that actually know this is true. But as the economy gets tougher and tougher to live in, you know, uh, food goes up, rent goes up, gas goes up, insurance goes up, everything goes up. You know, taxes go up, or, you know, blah, 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 blah. There's less available money for things like church offering. And so what happens is the, the discretionary spending, you know, you got to eat. The discretionary spending gets cut back and churches have less and less money to use for their you know, ability to pay their expenses and pay their pastor and pay their heating bill and pay their electric bill and keep their doors open. And so our churches are going to suffer more than you realize if and when we go through a recession over the next few years. But one of the things I'm hearing from people in regards to the stock market right now is that, you know, we the bottom's in and the Fed is going to pivot and we're just going to front run this pivot and life is good. But as I've been warning you every week, and I'll probably continue to put this up until we finally get this crash that I'm looking for, which could be a year away yet or even longer. We're going to you know, have many crashes along the way, but until it bottoms in maybe is what I'm going to try to say. And, and again, you don't know the bottoms in until after it's in. Does that make any sense? Uh, you don't know the bottoms in until after it's in because hindsight's always 2020. Foreknowledge is a little bit iffy, but... We can get a direction and indicator from a lot of different places. But the majority of the decline in these bear markets occurs after the Fed pivots. And uh, Powell said yesterday that you're probably going to have to raise uh, interest rates by uh, 50 basis points this next month because the economy is not slowing down at all. In fact, it's almost heating up. So he said he's going to have to raise them higher and longer. That does not sound like a pivot. So be aware of that if you have money in the stock market. Okay. My concern is this. When the stock market crashed in you know, 1929, it didn't get back to even for 25 years, okay? So any money you had in the stock market went down and then it didn't get back to even or go up you know, for 25 years. So uh, I know people that, um, you know, if you look at you know, the stock market, it was at, this is the Dow Jones, it was at like 375. And it went down to like, it looks like about 40, okay? Um, th that's a lot of decline. And then it wiggled around, you know, that was a low. But then, it, you know, it went up a little bit, then it went down. Then it went up a little bit, then it went down. It went up and then down, up and down, up and down. If you would be able to trade every one of those, you know, ups and downs, um, you could be making money. But if you only were long, in other words, you know, buy it and hold it, you didn't get back to even for 25 years. And so, you know, if, if your money's in a mutual fund, if your money's just sitting there long term, you know, I'll use this when I retire, you know. You know, I bought, you know, let's say you bought Tesla, you know, I don't know how many years ago. Um, Tesla's gone through a lot of splits and done really well, but lately it's it's crashed a lot. Um, you know, so um, it's interesting, you know. Um, uh, these companies that we think are, you know, strong, Walmart, I think is you know down over the year. It's going to go down a little more yet probably. Um, Amazon, 
you know, has gone through stock splits positively, and, and they've been down a lot. Um, these companies are going to take a while to respond, but they'll go up again eventually, but you have 25 years. And so th- that's my concern. Um, we're at a really decent rally in the stock market right now. We've, we've made up a lot of the losses we had since October. But if you don't have the ability to get out in this next correction that's coming up, all the gains that you had will be lost. Um, so you might be happy now. And if you could look at your you know, 401k right now, you're like, oh, I'm almost back to even again. Uh, then you come back and look at it two months from now, and you're like, oh, I'm down 25% again. Uh, you tell me. I mean, you do you. Uh, I'm just saying you have to have the ability to control your money and do things. Let me tell you what the story I want to tell you. I met a young man. Oh, I, I've known him since he was born, basically. And uh, his dad was a pastor, and his dad still is a pastor, and his dad's a really good pastor. And this young man, uh, when he got out, he wanted to join the armed services. And his dad went up to him and said, you know, I, I appreciate you wanting to do that. It's an honorable thing. But he said, there's a lot of unsafe people that are willing to go and fight for their country. And that's true. I mean, uh, there's a lot of safe people, too. But that's something that whether you're saved or unsaved, you can fight for your country. His dad looked at him and said, you know, we need more grace pastors. And, and that's true. We do need more grace pastors. And so what his dad asked him to do was, to, hey, would you consider becoming a pastor rather than joining the military? And he came to me because he was frustrated because he, he didn't want to hurt his dad's feelings and he did not want to be a pastor. He said, I can't do that. I cannot do what my dad does. He makes it look easy, but I just don't feel like I could do that. I don't want to do it. Because what I really want to do, he said, is I want to start a business and I want to be successful at it. He said, I'd love to be a millionaire and support churches rather than preach at them. He said, you know, I don't mind speaking here and there and stuff, but he said, I just don't want to be the pastor. I want to go to work and I want to be a successful businessman and then funnel money into Grace Churches. And there's a lot of truth in that that people don't realize is, you know, one of the things I want to do is I'd like to help you protect your money so that you have some money, not only so you can take care of your family, but so you can help take care of your churches. Um, That's the way God designed it. Um, uh, Charles Baker always said it takes 10 families to um, start a church if every one of them is giving 10%. And I know tithing's not for the day. These are just examples, okay? 10 families, and every family is giving 10%, the pastor will make the average of those 10 families as income. And you're like, well, the pastor doesn't deserve that much. Um, Yes, he does. He probably deserves more because of everything he has to go through, but that's just how life goes. Um, most successful grace people, um, because of when they grew up now and they're retiring, in fact, even people in my church, they own multiple houses that are all paid for. They have multiple cars. They go on multiple vacations, and they're actually living really well. Okay, If, if they get into trouble and you know their houses have you know, lose their value, whatever the case may be, and the economy flattens it's going to affect their ability to give money to even even my church and uh, i'm sure that's true with your church too so we want to have successful businessmen and we want it you to know how to protect your money that you have out there whether it be a house or whether it be a car or, or you know whether it be and like i said right now don't don't be buying a house I'm like oh dave i want to buy a house it's down you know um you know don't be buying a house wait like well why um because there's a correction coming in the housing market well how much i don't know Fifty percent sound pretty good to you. I don't know. Maybe maybe it'll only be twenty five percent, but I'll guarantee you houses aren't going up. Um, don't buy a car right now either. Um, the supply and demand is going to uh, allow them to go down. And price of cars went up a lot during COVID, and, and some of that bubble has to be popped. The housing bubble has to be popped. Uh, these, these bubbles have to be popped, and that's just normal. And that's good. Unfortunately, the government likes to manipulate them, but that's another issue. Again, as we look at these cycles of a, a market, we're emotional people. And, and right now, we're, we're the second level there. I don't know if I put it in the right place. But, you know, we're, we're not at the high anymore. That happened um, last January, I believe. Last December, I think, is when we had the high, high, high. And now we're back up. Uh, the S&P is back up around 4,000 again. And we're at the complacency. Hey, good old days are back again. You know, we're not going to do that again. Life is good. But the trouble is all of the, the symptoms are still there. I'm sorry. You didn't treat any of the, the, you know, the, the cause, I guess you could say, of what, what's causing the problem with this market. And the thing I've learned when it comes to trading, when things I've learned when it comes to the stock market and, and the economy and stuff, is it's like a giant aircraft carrier. 
If you tell an aircraft carrier to turn around, it takes hours and hours and miles and miles to turn that thing around. Our economy is the same way. It's going down the road at, you know, over miles an hour, and we're saying, hey, we're spending money too fast, slow it down. You know, the cause and effect takes forever to show up. And we're going to start seeing, you know, lower earnings and stuff probably this next quarter when the earnings come out, and that's going to cause trouble for the stock market. And, and the Fed will eventually pivot. Uh, the Fed will probably hit a crisis is what the thinking is um, because their thinking is they're just going to keep tightening until you know they fix this and I think you're going to break it and then they're going to have to start printing money again and then that's probably the beginning of the end for hyperinflation which will probably take another 10 to 15 years before that that goes into effect but all these cycles will come into play but eventually we're going to get past this complacency and we're going to have anxiety and I think we're that's the next one we're headed towards um and i want you to be prepared um like well what do you mean by prepared and and i've been i've been telling people all along in my church hey you need to have extra food on hand you you need to be um get out of debt if you can um you need to not be buying big ticket items right now you need to be hunkering down and and living a simple life because i'll guarantee you if you would have talked to people in the roaring 20s and if you look you know they had cheap money back then the Roaring Twenties was basically euphoria too, and it ended in a Great Depression. And they didn't call it the Great Depression until after it was over. But it, it, the Roaring Twenty, was the pinnacle, and it, it crashed after that. Cheap money, easy money, and it, it caused all the problems that were there. So, so be aware of that. I, I want to help you have peace, and if you have peace, you won't have anxiety because you're going to know, you know what's going on. Okay. In um in Matthew six nineteen again I want to do a comparison here because a lot of Christians don't understand the difference between um law versus grace to where God was micromanaging um people's lives in uh, underneath the law and if you look at what Christ was saying here he said it for a reason and uh, there's a book out there called Jesus wasn't talking to you um, when Christ said this he wasn't talking to you at all he was talking to Israel. Now, if you look at what Christ was talking about here, is the next event that was supposed to take place for Israel was they were supposed to go into the, the tribulation, seven years of hell on earth, and then Christ was going to come back and set his kingdom up. So as they were preparing for the tribulation, one of the things you got to remember is during the tribulation, um, your, <laughs> your investments are going to wither away. Anything you have will disappear. You will have no assets because the world's going to be on fire. It's going to burn down to the ground. You know, and even the Gospels tell us, you know, unless the days be shortened, all flesh will perish. That's how bad it's going to be. Um, three quarters, at least, of the world's population is going to be annihilated during the seven-year tribulation, probably more. So Christ is talking here. He's talking to Israel, and he says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth. Now, again, why? If, you're, if the next thing you're going into is the tribulation, and I know for a fact that coming out of it, you're not going to have anything. Why would you want to have anything going into it? You know, in other words, ooh, I got all kinds of land, and I got all kinds of servants, and I have all kinds of barns that are full of grain. I'm a millionaire. And Christ is like, eh, no, you don't want that, okay? He says, I got something better for you. Lay not up for yourselves churches upon the earth where moth and rust do corrupt it and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Now, this concept is good. You know, I had a guy say the other day that yeah, he's at the point in his life now where all he cares about is um, spiritual rewards. Now, I, I struggle with that a little bit because that shows a little bit of pride, and I don't think that should be our goal. I think we should live in the Christian life, live in the grace life, and then we get the rewards because of our attitude of gratitude, not because we're trying to work our way to more rewards. It's like, eh, I'm not quite sure, okay? Lay up yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For, your, for where your treasure is there will your heart be also. Now again, uh, Christ is not saying here, you know, hey, don't even ever think about tomorrow because you're going to lose it all. But they were. And, and from their perspective, it was very much that, hey, don't, you, you're going to lose it if you have it on earth here. But if you have spiritual rewards, spiritual treasures, those are going to come with you into the kingdom. And Israel will be rewarded in the kingdom in their faithfulness going to the tribulation. Okay? Now, in Luke chapter 12, verse 11, 
Christ is talking, he says, and when they bring you into the synagogue and upon magistrates and powers, he's talking to the 12 here, take ye no thought how or what thing you answer or what you should say. Now again, it's like, okay, Christ is saying, don't worry about what your response is going to be. Now how many times have you ever gone into um, court or had to speak and all you worried about was what am I going to say? I want to make sure I get this right. Um, I actually listen to all of my sermons and I critique myself. Um, and I'm probably my worst, I'm probably the worst person to critique myself because I'm very critical. Um, but I, I know what I wanted to say. I, I know how it came out. I, I can hopefully tell how it was perceived and, and then I can realize whether or not I brought the point across like I wanted to. So Christ is talking here. He says, oh, you guys are going to be captured. You know, you're going to be you know, brought in front of uh, leadership. And he says, don't worry about what you're going to say. It's like, uh, I worry about that all the time. You know, I'm constantly thinking about why I said what I said. Um, I want to think that I say everything on purpose once in a while. Um, my brain gets a neutral. But overall, I, I do actually know what I'm going to say. Now, I don't script what I'm going to say. And that's what gets me in trouble sometimes is... Um, if you know me, sometimes I say things and then it's too late, whereas there are some people out there that write every word down. I think that comes across very stale and, and very un, um, emotional in a sense to where you seem very detached, like you're just reading a book. Um, and people like to know you're real. This is what the answer is. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. And again, this is the, you know, the Acts chapter 2 where the Holy Spirit became upon the, the 12 and they, they spoke in tongues and uh, Peter knew things he didn't know he knew. Um, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. But that's not a grace problem, a promise. That's not a grace promise at all. That's a kingdom promise. God has not promised you. He's going to give you the words to say. Paul says, study to show thyself approved unto God. And what that verse basically says is study because you've been approved of, of, upon God. In other words, because God has put you in a position of a member of the body of Christ, you should study your Bible to know what in the world is going on. And one of the companies said to him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. So the, someone was there and he's like, hey, my brother won't share you know, my dad's wealth or whatever. And he said unto him, man, who, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. And, and the answer to that is, yeah, it does. That's, that's all the world cares about is what they possess. Okay? Um, and he spake a parable unto them, saying, Now again, this, this is Christ talking. He's going to give them a parable. And parables were, were truth mixed in with a story. And if you weren't interested in it, it kind of went right over your head. But if you were interested in it, it had a, a very deep meaning. And he spake a parable of them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plenteously. Um, and he thought within himself, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruit. So this guy was, uh, had a really good crop. Uh, he had lots of money. He was very wealthy. And he said, This will I do. I will I'll pull down my barns and build greater. And there shall I bestow all my fruits and all my goods. In other words, I'm going to expand. I want to make bigger barns to store more fruit. Now, that, that's good business sense. Uh, when I was, on the, I was on the farm, we were constantly adding things. You know, we had more cows, more, more land. We needed more grain bins, more storage, uh, more ability, because that's part of life is to get bigger and bigger and more profitable and more efficient. And uh, this guy's like, okay, I'm going to become more efficient. I'm going to get bigger and bigger. Um, and this is what Christ said, And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years, Take thine easy, eat, drink, and be merry. So this guy is saying to himself, hey, I'm just going to coast now. I'm set for life. And again, he's set for life in the physical sense to where he had more than enough physical stuff to meet his needs and then make him money. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then, the, then whose shall these things be which thou hast provided? Now, now again, pe people think that this is what God's doing today. That, you know, he's People who have pride, he's going to, you know, basically, he said, you're going to die. Now, the, did God kill this guy? I don't know if I like that wording. Um, and the answer is yes. He, he did because he was judged because he had bad works and a bad attitude, okay? And what should his attitude have been? So is he that layeth up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. So this guy was all about physical, 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 and didn't care about spiritual things. 
He said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what you shall eat, neither for the body what you shall put on. Again, a lot of us know this next section that Christ is going to talk about. We don't know the section before it. Uh, the point is, he was saying is, don't worry about physical stuff. And the reason is, as you go into the tribulation, physical will have no good at all. Bigger barns will not help you. More money won't help you. Nothing will help you. You're going to lose it all. In fact, a lot of them, we're going to lose their lives. So what good does it do to have bigger barns, to have more money, uh, to be coasting? It's not going to do any good at all. That's where he's going with this, okay? Uh, you know, take no thought of your life. Um, uh, if you're going to apply that one today, you're going to die. You will starve to death. And Christ goes on, he says, the, the Life is more than meat and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap. Well, neither they have storehouses nor barns, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowl? And again, that's a, that's a good illustration. You know, God's talking to Israel here. He's talking to the disciples, and like, you know, God, God loves you more than he, you know, he basically does these birds, and he takes care of them. And which of you may think, though he can add a stature, one cubit can, can worry and get you taller? Well, no. And if you're not able to do that, which is at least, why take ye thought for the rest? We worry about things like what we're going to eat and what we're going to wear. Consider the lilies, how they grow, they toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of those. If then God so clothe the grass which is today in the field, tomorrow in the cast in the oven, how much more will he clothe ye, O ye of little faith? He's talking to Israel here. And then he gives them a commandment here. He said, and seek not ye what ye shall eat, nor what ye shall drink, neither be ye yet doubtful, mind, doubt, doubtful minded. Um, let's, let's grab that. Let's not worry about what we're going to eat. Let's let, let's let God take care of us. Isn't that a good way to put it? I mean, these verses are in the Bible. You know, and the thing of it is, going into the kingdom, and in the kingdom, Israel will lack nothing. Gentiles will bring food to them. Gentiles will do their work for them. Gentiles will want to just pick up the slack. They're going to build their you know, vineyards, build their barns. I'm like, why would the Gentiles do that? Because as these Gentiles help Israel, God's going to help them. It's the ultimate trickle down. But Jesus wasn't talking to you here. I would love to name it and claim it right here, okay? For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. God knows you're hungry. God knows you need clothes. What do I do? Verse 31, but rather seek ye what? The kingdom of God. Hmm. What's that talking about? Is that a code name for the body of Christ? No. That's the thousand-year reign of Christ. When the thousand-year reign of Christ comes, all these things shall be added unto you. Well, who's the you? You is Israel. Israel will lack nothing in the kingdom. They will have health, they will have wealth, and they will have prosperity, all because of the Gentiles. But you've got to get to the kingdom, and you've got to quit worrying about it because God's going to take care of you in the kingdom if you're Israel. It's the ultimate trickle-down. And if you're a Gentile, just take care of Israel, God's going to take care of you too. And then he says, fear not, little flock. Okay, who's he talking to? Again, he's talking to the 12. Who's the big flock? Uh, Pharisees, Sadducees? priests that those are the people who were supposed to be in charge of israel but christ was going to give that responsibility now to the 12 if you're not a little flock for it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom remember the 12 we're going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes they're going to be in charge and then he says sell what you have give alms provide yourself bags which wax not old a treasure in the heavens that faileth not where no thief approaches neither moth corrupts hey spiritual rewards because the physical God's going to take care of. And there are people that run to this stuff and go, God's going to take care of me, Pastor. Why are you so worried? And I'm like, go for it. You do that, okay? For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Again, this, this all sounds really good if you're living in the kingdom or the tribulation or under the law. But we're not. We're not. We're not. Okay? First Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Okay, now this is Paul. This is Grace. Paul says, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded. Okay, well, what, what does that mean? I think they're more important than everybody else, okay? 
nor trust in uncertain riches, which they do, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Okay, in dispensation of grace, we have been given all things to enjoy. You know that? All things. Everything. You're allowed to enjoy it. Don't feel guilty if you have money. That's not the issue. The issue is don't get high-minded and don't trust in riches. You know, don't, don't put those ahead of God. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. The reason Paul says that is, and I know a lot of millionaires, I might know more than I probably should, um, what happens with a lot of people who become millionaires is they have one job in life and that's to protect their money because they think everybody's trying to get it from them. And in, in, in some sense that's true, but they also become very um, possessive of their money and don't like to share it, okay? Um, what does Paul say in verse 18? That they do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. If you have a lot of money, help people with that money. That's what God wants you to do. Help people with that money. He creates churches, individuals, whatever the case may be. Um, that's what God wants from people who have a lot of money and under grace. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 7. Again, another grace, grace verse. There's no, no law here. For you, yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we believe not in ourselves disorderly among you. For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. And then Paul says, Neither do we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we may not be chargeable to any of you. Do you think Paul had a good work ethic? He had a great work ethic. Paul did not have a problem working. Now, um, I have to say, my, I have five kids. Youngest is 20, the oldest is in his 30s. Um, they all have great work ethics. Um, most of my kids, other than the last two, grew up on a farm. And my, my oldest um, is doing really good financially. Just bought a Tesla. I'm not quite happy about that, but he didn't listen to me either. Um, but he had a really decent raise, a uh, huge raise, because he got promoted and he's doing real well. But growing up on the farm, uh, we milked three times a day. We milked just about around the clock, and there were sometimes, and we homeschooled our kids. There were sometimes when my help didn't show up for a variety of reasons, some of it good, some of it bad. And there were times that I needed help getting the cows milked because I had to do my work too. I was out there at 5 o'clock in the morning getting things set up. I was taking care of the calves. I was taking care of sick cows. That was some of my responsibility. I had other guys come in and do the milking. And so I'd wake my son up at 5 o'clock in the morning and he was in, eh, he was probably in seventh, eighth grade at the time. And he said, hey, Brandon, I need you to help milk a shift. And the shift was about six hours. And he'd go, Dad, I don't feel like it. I'm tired. And I'd look at him and I'd go, I didn't ask you if you felt like it. You got responsibility here. And the thing is, I paid him. He, my, my kid as a, a junior, I mean, a seventh grader and eighth grader, had more money in the bank than any kid I've ever known because he knew how to work. And I paid him. If I wasn't going to pay my other help, I was going to pay him. And so I paid him a really good wage to work. And he had all the toys he needed because of that. And he took that work ethic with him with him as an adult. And he is doing great because he's not afraid to work. Find where it says in the Bible that you work 40 hours a week and then you do nothing. Okay. Uh, you know, if, if you're only working 40 hours a week, you, you need to get yourself a second job, a side hustle. Do something you enjoy. You know, in fact, do everything you enjoy. If you, if you enjoy what you're doing, you're never going to work. You're having fun. And that's how I look at my life. I, I have never gone to work a day in my life. I, I enjoy what I'm doing. And I work a lot of hours. I, I probably work between 60 and 80 hours a week. And I love it. But it's not work. Otherwise, it probably would be a long week. And some of you just hate your job. Get a different job. Have two jobs. Have your own job. There's a lot of benefits to having your own business because you can write things off. The, the system is designed for people to own businesses. You know that? It's designed for people who own businesses. That's why people like you know Warren Buffett pays less taxes than his secretary does. Well, percentage-wise, yes. He pays more taxes, but percentage-wise, he pays less because he has a business. He writes stuff off. 
It's not earned in, it's, it's not wages, it's earned income for other ways. Salaries taxed at the highest rate. All right, so Paul's saying, hey, we, we, we worked. We weren't beggars, okay? Not because we have not power. In other words, um, we could have, like, made you guys support us. Um, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow. For a lot of people, I mean, my biggest thing is get a job. Like, well, no one's hiring. No, you're not looking. Everybody's hiring. I told my kids, I don't care how many jobs you have. And my um, youngest son is this proving me right. He, he gets a new job every six months and he gets more money every time. I don't know how he does it. He's like, oh, I got, I got a big raise for moving. He just moves around. He's doing something else now. Um, knows how to do things, knows how, how to network, knows how to get things done. Um, you know, and he's an example of hard work. Um, he owns a Tesla too. I don't know what the deal with Teslas are. Um, so Paul said, again, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example. And so work ethic is so important. And kids nowadays don't have work ethics. And I don't know why they don't. I don't think they learned it from their parents. But you, you need to teach kids, you know, you work, you can have stuff. And I and another thing I found, and, and I don't know why some parents do this, um, I know some parents that they send their kids to work, especially when they're in high school, and they say, you're now saving for college. And all your money's going to go to go towards your college savings. And I never did that to my kids. I made them save some of it, but I also allowed them to spend some of it. If you're never allowed to spend the money you make for fun stuff that you enjoy, okay? And my oldest son, he had you know he had um, bow and arrows with lasers on them. He had had you know he he had guns. He had toys. Uh, he paid cash for his first car, a nice car. I mean, all these things he had because he wasn't afraid to work. And I let him spend money on himself. I made him save too, but I let him spend money on himself. So don't don't take your kids' money from them and say, we're putting all this in savings. You never get to reap any of the joy. The same thing with you. If you were working really hard, do something nice for yourself. I don't care. Spoil yourself. Reap the rewards. And then that creates a good attitude, like it's fun to work because I now have money to spend on myself. And, and so Paul is not afraid to work here. That's not the point he's making here, okay? For even when we were with you, this we commanded you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Now, again, I think that would shape people up real quick if they're like, oh, I don't want to work, you know. Um, the amount of people who are on disability, and again, if you're on disability, you... you you may be disabled. And for that, I say, hey, I'm glad the system is there. But the amount of people who aren't disabled, they're just lazy, that are getting disability scares me because all that money comes from somewhere. It comes from the government, which means it has to be paid by uh, you, know, you and me who have a job, and there isn't that many people available to work, and we're running out of money. You know, We have the point where more people are drawing from Social Security than are working, more people are on disability than are working. Everybody's on the government dole. Well, there may come a day when the government goes, we don't have any money, guys. You're going to have to get a job or you're on your own. They go, oh, I don't know if that's going to work. Well, I think it worked before. Before we had all these programs, it'll probably work again. And people relied on family and people relied on the church. And right now, government has become family and government has become church, and that's the problem. Paul goes on in verse 11, he says, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly. Working not at all, but our busybodies. Hmm. What's Paul's answer? Uh, you don't eat. And what are they going to do real quick? Get a job. Get a job. Uh, it's a really good cause effect. If you don't, if you're hungry, you'll do anything. You know, you might even work. And so that that's that's the grace way. You know, most Paul's not saying, don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink or what you're going to wear. God's going to take care of you. Look how he takes care of the plants. Paul's saying almost the opposite. And guess what? He is. This is the dispensation of grace. God has not promised you health and wealth and prosperity. God has not promised you physical, you know, blessings in the sense where he's going to take care of you like that. But he did promise Israel that. But you're not Israel. Now them that are, are such we command and exhort by Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. In other words, get a job, buy your own food. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. So, so again, these are practical grace examples of the grace way. And it's, it's opposite of the kingdom way. 
And so you want to go to the Gospels and name it and claim it. Um, and if things get bad in the next couple of years, don't get mad at God, okay? Colossians chapter 3, verse 22, Paul says, Servants in all things, your masters. Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service or men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. If you work for somebody, you should do a good job whether they're watching you or not. And this is Paul's attitude. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, not unto men. Um, people ask me all the time, what job does God want me to have? What house does God want me to live in? In fact, I, I think, was it last Sunday? Or the title of our message was, does God care what color car you have? You know, what car does God want me to buy? You know, what color car does God want me to buy? Who does God want me to marry? And you know what God's answer is? Whatsoever. And it's not being snobby. You know, sometimes people go, whatever, which means I don't care. You know, you do you, I'll do me, I don't care. Paul says, whatsoever you do, which means whatever. In a dispensation of grace, God's answer to your question of who do I marry, God's question of what kind of car do I get, God's question to what job I have, God's question to all this stuff is whatsoever. He's allowed you to have that choice. It's kind of like when you get home at night and your wife goes, what do you want for dinner? And you go, I don't care. It really doesn't mean you don't care. It means you are giving that responsibility back to your, to your wife and saying, hey, whatever you want to do, I will be happy with it. I want you to pick. I'm sure, I'm sure we all have an opinion, you know. Like, hey, I want, you know, meatloaf and mashed potatoes. And your wife goes, oh, I don't want that. Oh, well, you asked me what I wanted and I told you. Well, I was hoping you'd pick, you know, fish. I'm like, well, I don't like fish. Why would I pick fish? So then it's like, no, it's whatsoever. It doesn't, God doesn't have a pen. You can have fish, you can have meatloaf, it doesn't matter. But whatever you do, do it hardly as unto the Lord. Whether you want to be a garbage man or whether you want to be a CEO of a company, whether or not you want to be a school teacher, or whether you want to be a bus driver, whatever you want to do, just whatever, just do it with the right attitude. Hardly as unto the Lord. And not as men pleasers, but do it in singleness of heart, fearing God. Not with eye service. I mean, it all makes sense. It makes a complete circle. Just be a good employee. That's all God wants. Whatever you do, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. God is going to reward you if you're looking for eternal rewards. We're just being a good employee. I believe God will reward you for being a good dad. I believe God will reward you for being a good mom. I believe God will reward you for being a good kid. Those are rewardable things. Being good, okay? For, but he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong where he is done. For there is no respect to persons. A lot of that is just part of life, you know. Um, you, you don't, you know, if you mess up at work and you don't show up, you're probably going to get fired. I was talking to a guy that works at, I used to work at Toyota. And uh, Toyota's big around here. They have a huge plant um, up north here about 20 minutes away. And I was talking to this guy and he said, yeah, I used to work for a Toyota, but they fired me. Oh, why did they fire you? He goes, well, I was late four times, only four times. And, and they let me go. He goes, you know, I, he goes, I was trying well, when you're running an assembly line, which is what they run up there, and the guy putting you know, the radios in doesn't show up, you can't go, eh, we just won't put radios in today. No, you, you need someone else to do it. And so for Toyota, you know, you, getting there a half hour early is probably getting there late. You want to be ready to go when that shift starts and not come strolling in five minutes later and go, oh, sorry, I'm late. They do not tolerate that, and they'll let you go so fast your head will spin because they need everyone there to run the assembly line. Um, that's just, you know, I, I very, 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 very seldom have ever gone and showed up at a job late. I hardly ever call in sick. You know that? In fact, I don't think in all the years I've been driving school bus, in all the years I've been a pastor, I have never, ever called in sick. It's like, you never get sick? First of all, I don't. I know people that you know, they, they think they're sick and they're not. Um, even on the farm, you know, because the cows have to be milked and because of some of the responsibilities I had in the farm because I was, you know, management and part of the owning owners, um, I would show up for work sometimes totally sick. I would do as little as I needed to do, you know, just to get what done I had to get done and go back home and lay in bed and try to get healthier. But and you want to say, well, you're an idiot. Oh, maybe I was, but the work had to get done. You just can't not, oh, we won't milk the cows today because, uh, well, we're sick. Uh, no, the cows have to be milked. Well, there are certain things you can put off, but certain things you can't. 
and in life it's the same thing you know i mean i, I just think people have a little bit of poor work attitude and poor work ethics today and they um it shows up okay okay and and again if you mess up it's not god punishing you it's just it's just hey sorry that's just life so we what we have here again the purpose of this podcast is is as practical as you can get you know we're, we're talking practical things um we are all affected by the economy good bad and ugly you know that like well i don't have any money in the stock market well, everybody else does. Most people's pension plans are in the stock market. Most people's retirement is in the stock market. If you if you have your money all in a savings account, you are going backwards big time. Now, granted, like I told you guys last week, you know, right now a one-year CD is paying almost five percent. But guess what? That's still not is up to inflation. You know that. That's why people say unless you get in the stock market, you're not going to keep up with inflation, um, which is fine during a bull market. The problem is I think we're in a bear market and that could be a problem because this bubble is going to pop. But know how to trade these markets. Know, know how to understand what's going on in an up market. Know what's going on in a down market. Know how to get in and out of a, your um, your portfolio so that you aren't losing money when it goes down or maybe not as much, but some stops in. Um, bear markets, you've got to run tight stops because it's like falling downhill. Bull markets, if you look what's been happening the last you know, up until last year, we were in a bull market for the last 30 years, and basically, you were falling uphill. Now you're like, well, how do you fall uphill? Well, you really don't. You just stumble and you give up again. You're st and then this idea of buy the dips, which worked really well over the last years, was because we were in a bull market. And everything always recovered. Now, granted, there were some companies that didn't, but as a whole, the S and P always recovered. As a whole, the Dow always recovered. Now, in a bull, in a bear market, you get underneath the 200-day average. Now you're falling downhill, and so you find that the corrections are faster and steeper, and quicker, and you don't have as much time to hesitate. But if you can get out at a decent time, and you can protect those losses, and then jump back in again when it, you know after it bottoms out you're going to make more money than you ever made because you're playing it both ways. But most people don't play it both ways. They only play the upside. And if you only know how to play the stock market going up and the market corrects itself by 50%, you just lost 50%. You know that? And until that 50% comes back, you're not even back to even. You know, I know you're, there's you know, dollar cost averaging and you're putting money in every week or every month. I, I understand that. But... The point is, the majority of the money will be, you know, stagnant. You know, if you're planning on retiring and you have all this money in the account and the market corrects itself by 50%, you just lost half your money. And I don't think you had that much extra in there. You can live on 50% less money. That's the problem. Pension funds are already un underfunded. If pension funds go down by 50% because they're all in the stock market, and a lot of these pension funds are, are in, in highly... Um, leverage in the sense to where they, they want maximum growth so they have maximum exposure and so their their losses are almost doubled because of they're working on margins and things and it's not good and so I think we're going to see pension funds fail we're, we're going to see companies fail and you're like can you afford to, to lose your job you know Tesla's you know laying off uh, Amazon's laying off uh, Microsoft is laying off, and we haven't even seen um, a lot of these come into play yet. These are just companies they have to tell you ahead of time. Um, things aren't good. You know, you look at what happened during the Great Depression. You know, the people had jobs. I know that, but enough people didn't have jobs and and didn't have a lot of money that we had a major problem. And I'm thinking, well, Pastor, you're worrying about something that you've never dealt with. I never have, but. I think I need to be prepared if it would. Well, what makes you think it's going to? The indicators, the people I follow, the things I see. You know, history doesn't, you know, repeat itself. But it sure rhymes an awful lot. So if you're prepared, you're not going to have the anxiety. If you're prepared, you're not going to have the panic. And if you're prepared, you're going to be able to sleep at night. So all I'm really asking you as grace believers is, number one, protect your money, protect your value, and let's see how this plays out. Again, if you want to buy a house, you go buy a house, okay? 
I know people that are trying to buy a house right now because they think it's, it, it lows her in. Hey, you do you. I don't care. I know people that went out and bought cars because they, they like the price. Tesla lowered their price again. Hey, you do you. I don't care. But as a whole, I think we need to step back and just look at things and just proceed slowly. Because I want to protect your money so that you can live to you know fight another day. You can live to retire and not have to run out of money when you turn 70. Like, oh, it's good for the first five years and they ran out of money. I don't want that. You know, that's a big fear people have is they don't have enough money. And then what I tell people is, and I've been telling people in church this, you know, the reason that Breeding Bible Church exists today is because a lady, I don't know what it was, 15, 20 years ago before I even came, she had money in her estate that she gave to the church. And it's because she gave the church this huge chunk of money that the church even exists today because, you know, people can appreciate the fact that somebody else, you know, uh, gave their money to the church. Because a lot of people are like, well, I can't be giving money to the church now because I don't know if I have enough. Well, then put it in your estate. So after you're gone, you know, because you don't know if you're going to live one year or 10 years or 50 years after you retire. But then once you're dead, you don't need it anymore because you can't take it to heaven with you. Then give some of it. You know, like, I don't I even amount, give a percentage. You're like, oh, I got to take care of my kids. You, you take care of your kids. I, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But why don't you give, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20% to a grace organization? You know, I want to say, you know, give it to my church. You know, no, you do you. You do what you want to do. But that way, you, you have the money if you need it. And then if something happens to you and, and you know, your kids are still going to get some of it, but then some of it's going to go to a grace organization. And if you are interested in eternal rewards, you know, like I want to get all the rewards I can get, I'll guarantee you that is a rewardable thing that God will reward you in heaven for because you gave money to a grace organization even in death when you're gone. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, again, we, we thank you for salvation. Lord, you died on that cross. You took our place, our punishment. You paid for our sins. And all we have to do is believe you did that for us because you loved us. It's faith plus nothing. Now we pray that everyone listening this evening understands that, that you are the answer to salvation, not our good works, but our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And by simple faith, we're all saved. Or as we go through these rough times, we ask for wisdom, we ask for guidance, um, just to make the right decisions. I know some of it's good, some of it's bad, some of it's ugly. But Lord, we, we need just the patience to, to prepare and not get caught off guard as, as things get rough and get difficult and, and we have some downturns. We pray, Lord, that it's not as bad as maybe we think it might be, but we realize that there's always hiccups. Even when things are good, there are families that go through hiccups. And we ask, Lord, that we can be available to others, that we can, you know, bear each other's burdens if the case may be. But the goal is that everyone should bear their own burdens. Again, we thank you for fellowship. We thank you for friends. We thank you for encouragement. And Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ, who is the reason we, we live and, and serve you. We pray this in your name. Amen.